Tonight we're going to finish chapter 46 and then do a very brief overview of chapter 47 in our textbook, Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem. The topic for tonight will be church discipline and government. Heavenly Father, pray you bless these words. Pray for your anointing on me to speak, Lord, in Jesus' name. So as usual, we'll begin with a review. And our goal in studying systematic doctrine is to apply methodical, systematic, and categorical study of the Bible so we can receive and apply God's thoughts through this class. We want to ensure when we teach the scriptures that we're only teaching God's words and thoughts, not that of other people or what we think the Bible is saying. We have a memory passage for this class. It's Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9 and 10. To whom will we teach knowledge? And to whom will we explain the message? Those who are weaned from the milk, those taken from the breast, for it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. In this class, we have this verse as our memory passage because we want to ensure what we're studying doctrine, we're studying doctrine. It is, we're doing so in a manner that is that builds a solid foundation based on the Word of God. We don't want to take individual scripture verses and stack them like dominoes, like stack little beliefs like dominoes. Because the first thing that we believe that contradicts, it'll, everything will fall apart. We want to ensure our doctrine stacks like a brick wall. We want a solid foundation that we continually build upon through God's Word, applying the whole Bible in everything we teach. So doctrine is very important to understand this class as we're teaching it, and we see it as God's words and thoughts as revealed through the Bible. In teaching doctrine, we teach and learn not our words and thoughts, not those of man, but God's and his alone. And we also stress studying doctrine systematically through this class. The reason we do so is because we want to avoid what is known as proof texting, which creates non-systematic doctrine. Pro proof texting is where we take one or a few verses of scripture and come up with our own doctrine instead of teaching God's words and thoughts. In teaching doctrine, we ensure what we teach is accurate to all of Scripture, not what we want it, not what we want the Scriptures to supposedly say. So during our previous class, we discussed various topics related to the church's power. First, we discussed how the church's power is primarily used in spiritual warfare, where we fight against Satan and his army to break through the souls of the lost and win them for, the, win them for Christ. We emphasize how the Lord has empowered the church to rebuke opposition from the gospel, or opposition, excuse me, opposition to the gospel from both within and without itself. Second, we briefly discussed the phrase, the keys of the kingdom, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. Here, we noted that while scripture is rather vague on this topic, it can be assumed from the context of other verses that this phrase refers to the church's authority to preach the gospel and open the door for others to receive salvation. <clears throat> Finally, we discussed the clear differences between the church's power and the civil governments. Specifically, we noted that the church is not to use physical force for conviction, conversions, while civil governments, though they should rule, acor rule according to biblical moral standards that follow God's natural laws, Governments have not been called by God to force people to believe or reject Christianity or a religion, including atheism, Islam, or anything of the sort. Although it may appear that greater power for change and influence comes from the secular governments, social movements, and institutions of this world, God has bestowed upon the church a power far greater that can destroy demonic strongholds, free people from spiritual captivity through the gospel, and open their hearts to true, everlasting change and victory that can only come from God's perfect love. <clears throat> now for tonight's class, we will provide a very condensed study of the remaining sections of chapter 46 and the entirety of chapter 47, which will respectively cover the topics of church discipline and government. Much of the text in these chapters contains speculation and questionable interpretations, especially due to the lack of explicit detail and instructions provided by the scriptures on these topics. The lack of explicit instructions is likely due to the churches varying wildly in membership, ability, and community needs as seen in the epistles. Thus, 
we will simply discuss what the scriptures have to say on the topics of church discipline and government, avoiding dogmatic statements on specifics the scriptures do not comment explicitly on. So first we will discuss church discipline. <clears throat> Throughout his epistles, the Apostle Paul called out certain church members, believers and otherwise, who participated in destructive, unchristlike behaviors that posed a serious threat to the churches they were members of. Because of this, Paul had to provide some, specific, some general principles for, for churches to follow when implementing discipline. First, it is important to understand when church discipline should be an exact, or excuse me, it's important to understand why church discipline should be exacted. There are three main reasons for this, for this based on scripture. The first being restoration and reconciliation of a believer going astray. Church discipline should work to bring about the restoration of a wayward believer to right behavior and the reconciliation between him, and, him or her and the Lord. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 notes our role in this process. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him, should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. James chapter 5 verse 20 also states, Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Coinciding with these verses is Hebrews chapter 12 verse 6, which reveals the key to successful church discipline. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. As this verse notes, the love of God the love of God should always be at the center of church discipline, with those exacting it hoping for repentance, restoration, and reconciliation to follow on the wayward believer's part. This must remain the case even in the event of asking a believer to leave the church for some time. This is implied to have occurred in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, and 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, with the concept of delivering the believer to Satan, which refers to putting the believer out of the church for some time. Thus, church discipline should never be used to exact revenge or hurt on a believer, but to lovingly guide him, him or her back to restoration with God and to tend to a return to Christ-like behavior. The second reason church discipline is needed is to keep sin from spreading to others. The Apostle Paul discusses this concept in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 8. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not even tolerated among the pagans, for a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Notice this. Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And, if, as, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present, that with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, but the, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In this passage, the Apostle Paul instructs the Corinthian church, the Corinthian church to have an incestual man leave the church for the sake of pre preventing his sin from spreading to other believers. Sometimes such, dis such discipline was exacted publicly before the body, as when Paul rebuked Peter in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, for his bad behavior in eating only with Jewish believers in the presence of his Jewish brethren. Again, the love of God must be the driving... Again, the love of God must be the driving force of discipline. Doing so to humiliate or mock a wavered believer, especially before a congregation, 
is immensely inappropriate, does not reflect Christ's love, and does not motivate that sinner to return to the Lord in repentance. Rather, this discipline should be done with God's love for the wayward believer and for his congregation, and for the Lord's congregation in mind. The final reason for church split discipline is to protect the purity of the church and the honor of Christ. While no believer will ever have a perfectly pure heart in this life, the continuation of outwardly evident sin from believers poses a severe danger to the church's purity in honor of Christ and the honor of Christ, especially due to it having the potential to misrepresent him and his work to non-believers. Romans chapter 2 verse 24 sees the Apostle Paul calling out the Israelites for misrepresenting God and influencing the Gentiles' perception of him. You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idol, idols, do you not rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. For, as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Paul also took great issue with the lack of discipline towards the incestual man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, as we just read. This attitude is even true with Christ himself, with him taking issue with churches being condoning towards outward sinful members in Revelation chapter 2, verses 14 to 15, and also chapter 2, verses 20 to 22. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also, I ha so also you, have, you have some who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans. And then, but I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. Seeing as Christ himself takes issue with a lack of church, church discipline, it is crucial that we enact it when necessary to ensure our churches strive for Peter's command in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. With these purposes in mind, the question may come to mind is when and how to execute church discipline. To be honest, while such explicit guidelines for all sins and situations are obviously not provided in the scriptures, the verses we previously read demonstrate the need to do so when obvious and continued outward sin is prevalent in a church member's life. Also, when and how to perform discipline should be modeled by the principles in God's word, such as the ones we just read. It should also involve serious prayer and perhaps fasting. In addition, it should be done and it should always be done with the purpose of keep, with the intention of God's love. In addition, the church, church discipline should always be done with the purposes of leading the sinful believer to return to rip God and repentance of recirculate, re, excuse me, to repentance and reconciliation, to protect other church members from falling into sin, and to protect the church's purity in Christ's honor. Thus, while exp explicit instructions for every situation are not given in scripture. What is provided is sufficient for the church to properly use its God-given authority for righteous discipline. The other half of our class tonight will discuss church government. Although chapter 47 is a very lengthy chap chapter, ironically it's one of the lengthiest in the book, our discussion here will be very brief. Much of the content here is Grudem discussing the differing opinions and interpretations on topics such as the meaning of the term apostle and the government structure a church should have. Although there is nothing necessarily wrong with this, as this study strives to solemnly teach systematic doctrine, we're going to limit our discussion in this chapter to simply cover the types of church officers, a term Grudem defines as follows. A church officer is someone who has been publicly, publicly recognized 
as having the right and responsibility to perform certain functions for the benefit of the whole church. A key focus of, the definite, of this definition is public recognition, which typically involves a person being installed or ordained in such a position. Positions that often fit this role include deacon, elder, and pastor, if considered separate, with the latter being if it's considered separate from the office of elder. These positions are important as they establish order within a church and ensure we place accountable and godly individuals to have authority in it. It should be noted, however, that those who serve with gifts such as hospitality, faith, or speaking in tongues are not necessarily those who are church officers, nor are those who practice them required to be in such a position to use them. Also, Grudem notes that other positions not listed in scripture, such as board members and treasurers, can technically be considered church officers. However, our focus tonight is on the ones described in scripture, which include the following. The first being apostle. Now this office is no longer available. That's very important to stress. This office is no longer available, but was held by the 12, by 12 of the, the, the excuse me, excuse me. It was held by 11 of the 12 of disciples, barring Judas Iscariot, and then also the apostle Paul. A defining characteristic of this unique ministry was being used by the Holy Spirit to write scripture. Also, these 12 believers were also witnesses of Christ following his resurrection. In this sense, especially the former criteria, there are no more apostles, and there have not been since the deaths of these 12 men mentioned. While the term apostle does appear in verses like Philippians chapter 2, verse 25, the, its Greek term here is apostolos, and it refers to a messenger, which differs significantly from the term used to describe the 11 disciples and Paul. Thus, while, apostles were, were, while the, the office of apostle was once available in the church, such a position is no longer, such is no longer the case for believers today. However, an office that is available is that of elder. This, the term elder is a general one in scripture for the office is a pastor, bishop, and overseer. Throughout the Bible, the descriptions of these terms are similar, indicating that they refer to the same general position. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 refers to the term pastor near the term teacher, with the Greek connecting the two and indicating that it is a major role for elders. The term shepherd is also used in the New Testament to refer to a pastor, such as in 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 2 to 5. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherds appear, shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another, for God oppose, opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Further requirements and duties of elders are given in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 to 7, and then Titus chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. You can turn your Bibles to these, pla these pages if you wish. The first being 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 to 7. First Timothy chapter three verses two to seven. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober minded, self controlled, respectable, hospitable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if, one, if, for if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. We will now turn to Titus chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. Titus chapter 1. Verses 6 to 9. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, 
and his children are believers and not open to the op- open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an if for an overseer as God's steward must be must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may, may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Beyond those requirements, or these requirements, Grudem notes that those who seek worldly achievement, fame, and success are not good candidates for becoming overseers. Instead, they should be able, an overseer should be able to teach and defend scripture, be a leader and protector for believers as a shepherd for the sheep, and be imitators of Christ, as 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11 notes. Another, another office that is available today that is mentioned in Scripture is that of deacon. The name for this position is a translation of the Greek term diakonos, I'm guessing probably got that wrong, but, which means servant. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 to 13, provide the most in-depth description for this position. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to too much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first, and let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives must likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons get a good standing for themselves and and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. A a related Greek word is also used in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 6, to describe the seven individuals called to serve the body in ways such as describing or distributing food. While specific roles beyond these verses are not mentioned, It can be assumed that believers in the office of deacon are to stand blameless before the Lord and faithfully serve as children. Grudem notes that these offices come together to form what is known as church government. However, while Grudem firmly believes a specific form of government should be used in most, if not all, churches, we believe scripture does not demand adherence to a specific structure, for it does not explicitly describe one. In fact, the epistles showcase a variety of government structures, as well as different na- differing names for offices, such as that of the elder, which other churches have used, like pastor, bishop, and overseer, and shepherd. However, some general guidelines to follow are the need for a leader, such as a pastor or shepherd, the need for order and decency, as 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40 states, and following the guidance of the Holy Spirit to establish a church government that best meets the needs of a local body and its community. Thus, the scriptures appear to indicate that God allows for fluidity in church government structure, so long as it it adheres to the principles I mentioned. One final topic that Grudem touches on in chapter 47 is the question of whether women can serve as pastors in the church. 1 Timothy chapter 11 to 14 provides the clearest answer to this question. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. It should be noted here that this verse is by no means prohibiting women from teaching or preaching in a church. For 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5 permits women to pray and prophesy in the church. Also, Priscilla is notable for teaching fellow believers alongside her husband, Aquila. In addition, the Lord has used women throughout history, such as Deborah, Miriam, and Huldah, for leadership positions. However, although women are by all means permitted to preach and teach in the church, it is the position of pastor that God has reserved for men exclusively. This mirrors the pattern of leadership that he has established in the family and in marriage, as well as Christ's headship over the church, as noted noted in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 24. Wives, submit to your own husbands, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body 
and is himself its savior. Now the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Thus, while the scriptures permit women to teach, pray, and prophesy, it prohibits them from being pastors. In this class, we briefly studied church discipline and government. First, we noted how church discipline has three main purposes. To produce restoration and reconciliation from wayward believers, to keep sin from spreading to other believers, and to protect the church's purity and Christ's honor. Discipline should always be execute, exacted with God's love and according to the Holy Spirit's leading. We then discussed church government, noting that it today is comprised of elders, who are pastors and overseers, and then deacons, who serve the body. We noted here how God allows for fluidity of governmental structure in the church to meet the needs of specific congregations. While it can be easy to take thematic stances on the topics we discussed tonight, teaching and following them systematically requires that we put aside our biases, let scripture interpret scripture, and seek the Holy Spirit's guidance in fluid and uncertain, uncertain circumstances. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. I pray you keep these thoughts in our hearts, Lord, and dismiss us safely in Jesus' name. Amen.